ओम स्थापकाय च धर्म से सर्वधर्मस्वरूपिणी अवतार वरिष्ठाय रामकृष्णाय ते नम जननी शारदा देवी रामकृष्ण जगद्गु पाद पद्मे तयो श्रिवा प्रणमा मुहुर्मु नम श्री यतिराजा विवेकानंद सूरिए सत्युसुखस्वूपाय स्वामी तापहारिणे my very dear and revered swami tripurananda ji maharaj dear swami sarvastanand ji and the assembled devotees it's a matter of great joy and privilege to be here in this beautiful center set in such wonderful surroundings ideally suited for a deep contemplative life and also to share with you some of my thoughts on this subject and also conduct a session on meditation meditation is a widely discussed topic in the last 10 or 15 years several universities abroad have regular sessions and meditations for their students we have other organizations teaching methods of meditation etc etc it's also necessary to understand is there anything very special in the way the ramakrishna order advocates meditation although meditation is such an important uh, and sought after topic many have very little idea and they think that it is something like something off the shelf you can just like that get it many of the youngsters who come to delhi to prepare for civil services from all over the country even now and then someone comes and ask me some ji how to meditate back some even while i'm walking somewhere they come and ask can you teach me meditation meditation requires quite a lot of preparations that way and more importantly we should understand at least try to understand what meditation really means meditation is not any action kriya or ritual it's not something to be done it's not just understanding it intellectually meditation in its highest form in its true form is a state of awareness is a state of awareness of our true and real nature we know who we are really when we are in a deep state of meditation so you can imagine all that goes by the name of meditation all over the world are not really meditation at all because meditation is not something which is done is a real state of awareness to which one gets to at some point or other of one's life and all that we do are all preparations or preliminary steps towards reaching that extraordinary state of awareness so you can understand how important and how difficult meditation is really again because it is our true nature the state of meditation is our true awareness our true nature who we are 
there is an unconscious seeking of this state of awareness in every human being practically. That is why people, even the most restless people, want to meditate because that is what would take us closer and closer to our real state of being or our state of existence or truth or awareness. Because in nature, everywhere, it's always the tendency to go towards its original state to its real state. That is the nature of existence. So in meditation also, there is always an attempt to go back to reality, of real nature. That is why there is so much of desire for meditation. Even people who are not really religious, do not belong to any particular system, do not profess any faith in any particular methodology, even all of them, irrespective of their religious belief, all wish to meditate. How to get to this state or how it really ripens or gets transformed into that awareness, more and more as we go along, we would try to understand. But primarily, let us start with this uh, practice, what it is, what are all the preliminary steps, what are all the preparatory steps which we can state so that one day that true state of awareness dawns in us and we really experience that meditative state. It is important, quite often meditation is mistaken for concentration. No, concentration is not meditation. Concentration is done with, with effort, concentrating the mind. But true meditation is beyond mind, beyond senses, beyond the indriyas. It's a state of transcendence. So obviously, concentration is not meditation. And uh, some of the people wrongly understand, try to concentrate and get into difficulty. For example, in many places, People are asked to concentrate on the tip of the nose or between the eyebrows, etc. In some of these parts, it is easier to concentrate the mind, focus. But unless there is a proper guide, unless we learn it the right way, it can lead to disastrous consequences. Now, to share with you, even one of the extraordinary monks with the order. Revered Swami Virajanaji, who could spend whole nights in meditation. Even he was once committing a mistake after the Mahasamadhi of Swamiji. He was so affected, so affected, so depressed. He started even before that also, he was meditating probably 10 to 12 hours a day. He was doing even more, even more. And he developed such terrible physical state unbearable headaches, so many other things. He was actually is a very stout and strong person, well-built. In fact, much of the Shamlata Ashrama, much of the work was done by him physically. He was so strong. But he was becoming so thin and emaciated and he was having an incurable disease, so to say. Nobody could cure him. The best of doctors. Because he was such a priceless gem in the order. Naturally, they made every effort, all the seniors tried. Then somebody suggested, why don't you go to Jarambati, to the mother? She was mother's disciple, in the sense. So he went, and the first question mother asked was, Baba, where do you meditate? He said, I meditate between the eyebrows. Concentration is so easy there, so I meditate. I can meditate for long hours. She, she was shocked. Baba, ki courage to me. What have you done? That's not the way. Meditate in the heart. And 
within a day or two, all his problems were resolved. Of course, after that also, even after he became the president of the order, there are stories how he sat for meditation in Shamalatal for night at 10 o'clock or so and just came down from the state next to the evening around 7 o'clock. He was such a person given to such deep states of meditation. So one has to be very careful. All of us, everyone wants to meditate. But the moment we sit down, the moment we try to concentrate our mind or gather our thoughts, we find that the mind is going in thousand directions, going everywhere. How to really bring the mind to that quietness? Because meditation has several definitions. The best is from the Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, where it says, Chitta Vritti Nirodha. That is yoga. Yoga, Chitta Vritti Nirodha. Yoga is cessation of vrittis in the chitta, in the mind stuff. How does it happen? The moment we sit down, the mind seems to simply get scattered in thousand directions. In fact, even when we are active, we feel the mind is more concentrated. We are able to focus. But when we try to meditate, it becomes more scattered. But it's all possible because it was a very question which uh, Arjuna asked uh, Sri Krishna. Chanchalam himana Krishna pramati balavadridam tasyaham nigraham manye vayuriva sudushkaram. How do I control his mind? It's simply going everywhere as if blown away by wind, as if somebody is forcefully taking it away in all directions. How do I do that nigraha control? Sri Krishna assured him, Asamshem Mahabahu Manodur Nigraham Chalam Abhyasena Takaunteya Vairagyena Chagrihyati. Sit. You're a great warrior. I understand what you say. It's true, but it's possible. Two disciplines Abhyasa and Vairagya. In, um, even after the two, he place a bhyasa, give that the first place. Practice, 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 practice makes perfection. We see people who succeed in several spheres in life, great sportsmen. How do they do it? In shooting, 10 out of 10, does it happen in a day? Thousands and thousands and thousands of times they practice. You know, a great singer was teaching her small son, Riyaj, how to practice. They have put that video on YouTube. This is, remember, how many times? 300 times, 400 times, 1000 times, any number of times till you get it. If that is required for all that we achieve with the Indriyas, with the senses, imagine the amount of practice that is required for something which is beyond the indriyas. So practice, abhyasa. So you know, any practice, if it is done systematically, religiously, with tremendous regularity, it will definitely produce an effect. So, as far as possible, we should try to practice these disciplines every day at the same place, same time. So it's always good to sit apart a separate room or a separate corner, some place wherever we live and also try to practice these disciplines at the same time every day. The problem with most of us spiritual aspirant is suddenly we do it so much one day and then for the next seven days we do nothing. 
rather it's important to do it every day whatever we do that much we'll certainly do a little more we may do but the minimum like this amount of food we'll certainly have some special items we can take more but what is the minimum required it should always be there see we we think so much about food for the body nutrition these that protein carbohydrate so many division so many aspects but we 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 really you know pour all waste material all useless material or worthless material into our mind and how do you think that the mind will be healthy the body is like that the body can go here its health parameters if you are not careful about our diet how much more we should be careful about something over which we have very little control so it's very important supposing we are we indulge completely in restless activity throughout the day and suddenly if you sit in the evening and think that you can concentrate and meditate no it will directly depend upon the type of life you live yes all of us have responsibilities we have so many things to do and so on and so forth but within that also some amount of discipline we cannot otherwise expect the mind to be calm when we sit for meditation that's why at least this much same place same time preferably in the morning before we begin our activities how many people get up and try to see what are all the missing calls or missing messages that came throughout the night but all that would only distract the mind morning best is to try to get up reasonably early so that you know before others get up and disturb us wash put on neat clothes and sit on an asana or a seat especially designed for that purpose designated for that purpose you can light a small lamp or burn a little incense stick have the picture of your own ishta devata or object of worship or anything else that would elevate your mind and try to practice this same place same time every day that would help to certain extent certainly then it's always preferable to sit on the floor cross legged either in padmasana or sukhasana sit comfortably not so stiff when making the body more tensed no we should not bend one should sit erect with the spine the neck and the head in straight line there are scientific reasons for all that such a posture would help the flow of prana energy in a very regulated manner in the system that's why sitting erect is advocated because you know imagine when we try to reach that extraordinary state of awareness what perfect conditions should be prevalent in the body and mind at that time there should be a very steady and even flow of the pranic energy in the body so one should should sit erect with the backbone neck and head in straight line preferably one can sit on the floor if not possible one can definitely sit on the chair it's more important to meditate rather than to sit once that is done the first exercise on my try is meditation actually is inwardness going deeper going deeper going inward going inward inwardness of the highest order is ultimate state of awareness or meditation where do we begin because all our senses all our indriyas are designed by the creator or god in such a way that they always go outward 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 i you see you can even see which is 100 feet away try to see as much 
but never ever we try to see inward what's within us ears someone sitting at the distance of 30 feet oh they are talking about me only but do we ever try to listen to the voice within us that constantly reminds us about the purpose of life about great ideas great values great truths no smell oh i can't tolerate smell but what about what is inside you so all our organs all our indriyas all our senses are designed constantly to go outwards outwards out that's the nature of creation that's why in the patu upanishad there's a very beautiful sloka which explains paranchikani vatrana swayambhu parang pashyati nantarat khani all this the indriyas are designed constantly to go outwards 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 so 99.99 to the power infinity the mankind it does not see inwards na antaratma but does no one see that yes there are exceptions who are they kasti dhira those extraordinary people whom the upanishad calls as dhiras kasti dhira pratyeka atmanam ekshat they see the pratyeka atman the atman within how avrita chakshu by turning their gaze inwards why amrutatvam ichha why is it necessary why should we meditate at all what is all this putting oneself to so much difficulty practice why not live a life as our senses are designed always going outwards always having parties always having why not it's not possible find out every person the richest and the poorest unless there is some kind of a pursuit in that direction they are absolutely without doubt all of them without exception are unhappy full of stress sorrow and suffering people try to camouflage by being more cars more houses more dress more parties more spouses it's all only the design to cheat oneself inwardly because unless we reach our true nature obviously you cannot find that joy or peace or happiness so everyone wants to be peaceful everyone wants to be happy all that is possible only when you turn our gaze from outward to inward that's why amrutatvam ichchan those who want immortality mortality does it mean conquering death in that sense i will live for 1000 years like ashwatthama no death would become immaterial supposing i am prepared to die this very moment i am the happiest person on earth because all those who say i want to go i want to go none of them want to go really they only say like that because you know they really don't know what exactly is the problem they are trying to fix it at a wrong place and try to say oh i'll go they cannot go in their house if you go and nail a small nail they will shout oh my grandfather built it please don't do it are you want to go who is going to do anything after you go why are you bothered no 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 so we are attached to thousand things but we say that i want to go i want to go i don't nothing like that so the real way to conquer death to really attain that state of calmness that peace that extraordinary sense of happiness is only when we realize our true nature which is described as satchit ananda swarup which is existence knowledge bliss immortal so many other descriptions are there in our scriptures we do that is our nature this is all been discussed elaborately with tremendous sense of logic and reasoning one can go through the scriptures and you know in a small way all of us get a glimpse of it every day every day what happens when you go to sleep all over indriya has become completely quiet there is no action because in when you are angry we try to hit and even in the dream somebody 
you throw your hands about maybe, but they're all involuntary reactions. At one stage, at the level of the dream, the indriyas are quiet. The mind is very active, powerful. When you go to a state of deep sleep, even that is not there. Even if the mind is quiet, but in and through that, there is some awareness because there is no function of the organs or the senses or the indriyas. The mind does not function, but it's something which is witness even to that. That's what says when you get up, oh, I had a good sleep. I slept very well. I'm very happy. I did not know anything. The one who says did not know anything, that sakshi, that witness, that's a hint of that supreme state of oneself. But one has to understand, because one of a, a great uh, devotees, he was a pandit. He was uh, running our study circle in Mysore some 78 years ago. Many of our great swamis have studied in that study circle, the Vedanta study circle in Mysore. He wrote a book, Sleep Equal to Samadhi, something like that. He said, sleep and samadhi are not different. He had written very elaborately. Maybe one gets some hint of that in the sleep, but is in a very ordinary way, we can refute this argument because you go to sleep and come back the same foolish person with all our problems, all our difficulties, all our restlessness, whatever we had before sleep, the same thing comes back. Only the body had a little rest in between. But samadhi, if someone gets it, is a totally transformed person. Is not the same person at all. His limbs are there, his indriyas are there, his senses are there. They do function, but the quality of their functioning is totally different afterwards. So that is the difference. So sleep is like imitation gold. It's not to be mistaken for the real gold. It will, the shine might be there, it might have the same color. But if you, any person was purchased jewelries and handled them, can easily understand the difference between the two. So still, this gives us a small hint of what's possible. What extraordinary state of awareness is possible? So you go to sleep involuntarily. By practice, you attain such a state of mind that becomes something of your own. When that calmness can be at your control, it's obviously a totally different experience. It's not doing something involuntarily. So that kind of state of awareness, those who have had that, and many, even some 50, 60 years ago, there was a very great saint called Ramana Maharshi in South India. He had done such extraordinary, unbelievable sadhana. They had it. Once he had it, people who, could, they, people who saw him instantaneously felt that here is a person who has had the highest experience. Just to be in a room, he will just be reclining. He would hardly talk. All the problems of people who would go to him would get simply dissolved. There is no need for most of them to even ask him. His very presence, just his very gaze, a big photograph of him is still there. If you go to that room, kind of that vibrations people even now feel. You can imagine how it must have been when he was alive. So these are all totally different experiences, but it is possible. People have had it. Leave alone Thakur Ma and Swamiji, the direct disciples, even the next generation sadhus. When someone, very recently, I will not name him, he was a great person in the order. Someone asked him, Maharaj, have you realized God or have you seen Thakur or something like that? He said, I can't say anything about that. But when I close my eyes, Thakur Maa Swamiji, Jal Jal Kocche. I see the shining form of Thakur Maa and Swamiji. Or Moner Kono Vasanani. There's no desire in the mind. Something, say some 20 years ago, I'm seeing. So, 
let us not think that it's all not for us, not possible. It is possible. Even if you make a beginning, you would have taken a great step. That's what Gita says. Salpam apyasya dharmasya trayate mahatu bhayat. Because in spiritual life, there's nothing like loss. It's not like investing in the stock markets or anywhere. It only keeps adding. It only keeps growing. Whatever you do, put in small quantities. A little, a little, a little. Suddenly it will become extraordinary one day. But what is required is systematic, steady, day after day, day after day, day after day, relentlessly, not giving up. Mother says, Godir Khatar Mata, like the hands of the clock. Do it day after day, day after day, day after day, without fail. Previously, there used to be a system in the banks. Now it is not there, I think. What you call as recurring deposit. Every month, on the fifth of every month, or fourth or order designated day, every month, some certain amount of funds have to be transferred to a particular account. And after five years, six years, ten years, what was 100 rupees per month, it will become several thousands with interest, etc. You can buy some fridge or some big thing those days. So meditation, our spiritual practice are like that, in a small quantity, but keep on adding, keep on adding. So the first, I said, after we sit erect, first close the eyes. Now, now onwards, all of us will sit till the end of the session with eyes closed. Why? Because at least shut one window. The innumerable windows that are opening outwards all the time, distracting the mind. Perhaps the most active Indriya is eyes. So let us first shut it. So that you don't see anything physically, externally. When there's a calm atmosphere, there's nothing to be heard through the years except what is meant to be heard. So the other Indriyas are relatively much quieter. The most difficult Indriya, the sense organ, the eyes. So we close our eyes. Sit direct, close our eyes. Suddenly we find the mind is darting, running. It, uh, 1,000 meters, 10,000 meters, uh, marathon race. What to do? So one of the first exercises which we will accept, attempt is just close our mind, close our eyes. Allow the mind to wander freely. Let us not try to control it, restrict it, restrain it, or give it any direction. No. At this time, in the beginning of the practice of the efforts at meditation, you close the eyes and allow the mind to wander in any direction it likes, without any restraint. But I, because it is my mind, I am not the mind. I am different from the mind. The Sakshi, the witness that watches where all the mind is going. Just don't worry. Let it go to any place, good, bad, ugly, desirable, undesirable, doesn't matter. Because whatever we have given as inputs, whatever we have fed in, obviously the mind is a supercomputer. It has registered everything. And they will come out, and they will come out at the most inappropriate time. Doesn't matter. Watch the mind. Let's become a witness and watch where all our mind is going for the next few minutes. This is our practice. And every day when you sit for meditation, please try to do it this way. If you do it like this, for some time, say 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, before we try to do something else, then you'll find after some time, the mind would automatically become quieter because we're all, it will become tired. We're all, it would wander after some time. There is no place to wander and you will try to settle down. At that time, let us see what we can do. Now, the next few minutes, with closed eyes, sitting erect, we'll observe where all our mind is trying to go.
the mind is uh, slowly coming to a state of restfulness. Another exercise which we may practice is by controlling the breath. Because the prana is connected to the air we breathe. So a regulated breathing we should not try to hold because kumbhaka is risky. Regulated breathing can also help to bring our mind to some kind of control. Sometimes you might have observed when you are deeply worried by something, you are just sitting alone, deeply possessed by worrying thought. Suddenly you let go a deep breath and you find that you are kind of lightened. It's mentioned in one of the talks of the great uh, Thikhat Nan, the Vietnamese monk, was well known for his uh, mindfulness articles and practices. He was once uh, lecturing in America about the Vietnam War. Someone in the audience got up and said, the war is happening in Vietnam. Why are you lecturing here? He did not say anything. He took a deep breath and then came out with a stunning answer. He said, a tree has to be watered at the roots and not at the top. The roots of Vietnam War are here. That's why I am lecturing here. So by practicing this regulated breathing, one can feel some calmness of the mind is attained. For that, let's first close the right nostril, breathe in through the left nostril, then close the left nostril and breathe out through the right. Then breathe in through the right nostril, close it, breathe out through the left. This way, alternatively, breathing in and breathing out through the two nostrils, we can attain some level of calmness of the mind. Let's practice it a few times.
another practice in this regard is to remind ourselves of our true nature again and again. The problem is we have got entangled into so many upadhis or identifications. I'm rich, I'm poor, I'm old, I'm young, I'm man, I'm woman, I'm a sadhu, I'm a householder. So many kinds of wrong identifications. But our scripture says we are not all this, we are something else. So something which might remind ourselves very strongly about our real nature can help us in this regard. Just to give you an idea, I would chant the first sloka of Nirvana Ashtaka of Shankaracharya, eight stanzas on Nirvana or liberation. The first stanza goes like this. <clears throat> Mano Buddha Hankara Chitta Nina Nachas Rotra Jive Nachagrana Nitre Nachavyoma Bumi Rate Jonava. Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham I am not the mind, buddhi, chitta, or hankara, which are all, of course, modifications of the mind. I am not the senses or indriyas like the ear, eyes, nose, skin, etc. I am not the five elements such as the akasha, bhumi, vayu, water, or fire. Who am I? I am that Chidananda Swarupa Shivoham Shivoham. The ever blissful consciousness, infinite boundless, deathless, eternal Atman. I am that infinite consciousness. That's my nature. Even to feel that way, even to imagine ourselves that way is a great step that gives us great feeling of peace, joy and strength. Whenever we sit for meditation, we should always pray for the welfare of the entire world because our well-being depends upon the well-being of everyone else. So we should mentally offer prayers for the welfare of the entire humanity. Sarve bhavantu sukinaha, sarve santu niramayaha, sarve bhadrani pashyantu ma kaschit. Dukkha bhag bhave. Let everyone be happy. Let everyone enjoy good health. Let everyone hear only auspiciousness all around. Let no one suffer dukkha or misery. For any learning, any vidya, the help or guide of a, of a teacher or a guru is extremely important, much more for Adhyatma Vidya or spiritual knowledge. Of course, we all, for convenience or for practice, we have a human guru. But ultimately, our own inner nature, Sachidananda, that alone is a real guide or guru. As we grow in spiritual life, more and more the directions would come from within. But initially, we must have a guru to help us in our struggles. So the real guru or the ultimate guru, how does the guru help us? 
we should understand the nature of our Guru as to who is our real Guru. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Reva Param Brahma, Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha. My Guru is Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara. Is much more than that, is verily the Param Brahman. My salutations to such a Guru. So, whomsoever may be your Guru, should always try to perceive, visualize that our Guru is virtually that Supreme Param Brahman. Let us not look at the external form, shape, size, or characteristics of a Guru. And Guru is really the very leader, Parabrahman. How does such a Guru help us? Ajnana timirandhasya jnana jana shalakaya chakshurun militam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha Our eyes are covered by the thick layer of darkness, of Ajnana. The Guru applies the collarium of knowledge and opens our eyes. My salutations to such a Guru. Not only that, we are all always bothered by the karma phala of the numerous past births. They often come as hindrance in our spiritual life, in our sadhana. How to get rid of all that? The Guru can just wipe them away. How does he do it? Aneka janma samprapta karme dhana vidahine atma jnana pradhanena tasmai shri gurave namaha Aneka Janma Samprapta. The accumulated karma falas of numerous births of karma falas. He just burns them away or wipes them away just as fire burns wood. My salutations to such a guru. So we are sitting erect. He practiced mindfulness and breath control and reminded ourselves of a real nature, prayed for humanity, offered our salutations to Guru. So we are trying to go deeper and deeper slowly. Ultimately, the more and more we remind ourselves of a real nature, finally, just by itself, without any external aid, we just descend into that state of true awareness. Till then, again and again, we need to remind ourselves who we are, what's our real nature, why are we here, what are we doing, what's the purpose of life, what are we to do, how to go to that state which is beyond all these dualities, beyond all these incongruencies, inconsistencies, unrealities. What is that? So again, a chant which might help us. This time I will chant and all of you might repeat after me. Shivoham, Shivoham. Shivoham, Shivoham, Chidananda Rupoham, Chidananda Rupoham, together. Shivoham, Shivoham, Chidananda Rupoham, 
ಶಿವಂ ಶಿವಂ ಚಿದನಂದೋಂ ಶಿವ ಶುದ್ಧೋಹಂ ಬದ್ಧೋಹಂ ಮುಕ್ತೋಹಂ ನಿತ್ಯೋಹಂ ಶುದ್ಧೋಹಂ ಬದ್ಧೋಹಂ ಮುಕ್ತೋಹಂ ನಿತ್ಯೋಹಂ ಶುದ್ಧೋಹಂ ಬದ್ಧೋಹಂ ಮುಕ್ತೋಹಂ ಶಿವ ಶಿವ ಚಿದನಂದೋಂ ಶಿವ ಶಿವ ಚಿದನಂದೋಂ ಶುದ್ಧ ಬುದ್ಧ ಮುಕ್ತ ಶ್ರದ್ಧ ಬುದ್ಧ ಮುಕ್ತ ನಿತ್ಯೋಂ ಶಿವ ಶಿವ ಚಿದನಂದೋಂ ಶಿವ ಶಿವ ಚಿದನಂದೋಂ ಶಿವ 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 Let's perceive an eight-petaled, fully-blossomed red lotus in our heart. Because the cave of the heart, Nihitam Guhaya, that's where the Atman is felt or experienced. That's where we should experience our object of worship, Ishta Devata. In that eight-petal lotus, let's perceive the shining, glorious form of our Ishta Devata, resplendent, Sahasyavada, ever gracious to grant us the boon of mukti or liberation. We offer various articles of worship, like Padhya, Argya, Achamaniya, Punarachmaniya, Madhaparka, Gandha Taila Snaniya Vastra, Gandha Pushpa Dupa Deepa Naivedya. We offer all the items of worship mentally. Abhrishta Devata is accepting all our worship. We pray for the boon of mukti or liberation. Ending this endless coming and going. Taking us across this ocean of samsara. That's our prayer. So let us 
visualize the resplendent form of our Ishta Devata in our heart, constantly offering our prayers, surrendering ourselves at the feet of the Ishta Devata, praying for mukti, praying for liberation. One can pray, one can also repeat the mantra if one has been initiated. Otherwise, a deep prayer from the depths of our heart to the Ishta Devata who is already there. That's what we shall practice for some time now. 